Can I ask you about some other weird particles that make up our universe? Uh -huh. What are axions? And uh, what is the strong CP problem? Uh, okay, so uh, let me start with what the strong CP problem is. Uh, first of all, well, charge C is charge conjugation, which is the transformation, uh, the, the notional transformation, if you like, that changes all particles into their antiparticles. And uh, the concept of C symmetry, charge conjugation symmetry, is that if you do that, uh, you find the same laws that would work. <laughs> uh, so the laws are symmetric if the behavior that particles exhibit is the same as the part as the behavior you get with all their antiparticles. Uh, then P is parity, which is uh, also called spatial inversion. It's basically looking at a mirror universe and saying that the laws that are obeyed in a mirror universe, when you look at the, the, the mirror images, obey the same laws as the as the sources of their images. There's no way of telling left from right, for instance, that the laws don't distinguish between left and right. Uh, now, in the mid 20th century, people discovered that both of those are not quite true. <laughs> that <laughs> really the the equation that that the mirror universe, the, the universe that's that you see in a mirror is not going to obey the same laws as the uh as the the uh universe that 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 we actually exhibit uh, and, and interpret you could you would be able to tell if you did the right kind of experiments which was the mirror and which was the real thing uh anyway that so that's the parody and they show that the parody, parody doesn't necessarily hold it doesn't quite hold and that that op that in examining uh, what the exceptions are turned out to be to lead to all kinds of insight about the nature of fundamental interactions, especially properties of neutrinos and the weak interactions. It's a long story, but it's a, a very it's a so, so you just define the C and the P, the yeah. conjugation, the yeah. charge conjugation. Now that I've done that, I want to what's the problem? Shove them off. <laughs> okay, great. Because <laughs> uh, it's easier to talk about T, which is time reversal symmetry. We have very good reasons to think. Uh, CPT is a an accurate symmetry of nature. It's on the same level as relativity and quantum mechanics, basically. So that better be true. Uh, so it's or like symmetric when you when you do conjugation parity and time and time and space reversal. If you do all three, then you get the same physical consequences. Now, so but that means that CP is the, is equivalent to T. But but what's observed in the world is that T is not quite an accurate symmetry of nature either. So most phenomena uh, of at the fundamental level, so interactions among elementary particles and the basic gravitational interaction, uh, if you ran them backwards in time, you'd get the same laws. So if again going back, unless this time we don't talk about a a mirror, but we talk about a movie. If you take a movie and then run it backwards, <laughs> that's the time reversal. Uh, it's good to think about a mirror in time. Yeah, it's like a mirror in time. If you uh, if you run run the movie backwards, it would look very strange if you were looking at complicated objects and uh, you know a Charlie Chaplin movie or whatever. They, they, it would look very strange if you ran it backwards in time. But at the level of basic interactions, if you were able to look at the atoms and the and the quarks involved, they would obey the same laws. They to a very good approximation, but not exactly. So you so this not was, exactly that means you could tell you could tell, but you'd have to do very very subtle experiments with at high energy accelerators <laughs> to take a movie that looked different <laughs> when you ran it backwards. Uh, this was a, a discovery by uh, uh, two great physicists named uh, Cronin and F Jim Cronin and Val Fitch in the. Uh, in the mid 1960s, previous to that, over all the centuries of development of physics with all its precise laws, they did seem to have this gratuitous property 
that they look the same if you run the equations backwards. It's a it's kind of an embarrassing property actually because life isn't like that. So yeah. empirical reality does not have the symmetry in any obvious way, and yet the laws did. It's almost like the laws of physics are missing something fundamental about life, if 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 it holds that property, right? Well, I mean that's that's the embarrassing it's, nature. Of it's, it. it's it's yeah, it's embarrassing. Well, people worked hard and at at what's this is a problem that's thought to belong to the foundations of statistical mechanics or the the foundations of thermodynamics to understand how behavior which is grossly not symmetric <laughs> with respect to reversing the direction of time in large objects, how that can emerge from equations which are symmetric with respect to changing the direction of time to a very good approximation. And that's that's still an interesting endeavor. That's 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 interesting. And uh, actually it's an exciting frontier of physics now to sort of explore the boundary between when that's true and when it's not true, when you get to smaller objects uh, and exceptions like time crystals. Or, uh, I definitely have to ask about time crystals in a second here, but right, so, so the CP problem and T, so there's so flaws T. to all of these. We're in danger of infinite regress, but we'll, we'll convert soon. No, so it's, it's, can't the, possibly be turtles all the way down. We're going to get to the bottom okay. turtle. So, so, so it became, so it, it got to be a real, I mean, it's a really puzzling thing. Uh, why the laws should have this very odd property that we don't need, and in fact, it's kind of an, ex an embarrassment in addressing empirical reality. But it seemed to be almost, it seemed to be exactly true for a long time, and then uh, almost true. <laughs> and, and in way, almost true is even, is more disturbing than exactly true, because <laughs> exactly true, it could have been just a fundamental feature of the world. And, you know, at some level, you just have to take it as it is. And if it's, if it's a beautiful, easily articulatable regularity, you could say that, okay, that's a, that's fine as a fundamental law of nature. But to say that it's approximately true, but not exactly, that's, yeah, that's, that's, not, weird. that's, that's weird. So, uh, and then, so there was great progress in uh, the late part of the 20th century uh, in getting to an understanding of fundamental interactions in general that shed light on this issue. Uh, it turns out that the princ basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics plus the kind of high degree of symmetry that we found, the so-called gauge symmetry that characterizes the fundamental interactions. When you put all that together, it's a very, very constraining framework. And it has some indirect consequences because the possible interactions are so constrained. And one of the indirect consequences is that the possibilities for violating the symmetry between forwards and backwards in time are very limited. There are basically only two. Okay. And one of them occurs and leads to a very rich theory that explains the Cronin-Fish experiment and a lot of things that have been done subsequently has been used to make all kinds of successful predictions. So that's that's turned out to be a very rich interaction. It's esoteric and the effects are only show up at accelerators and are small and so on, but they might've been very important in the early universe and lead to them be connected to the asymmetry between matter and antimatter in, in the present universe. And so, but that's a that's another digression. The, 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 the point is that uh, that was fine. That was a triumph to say that there was one possible kind of interaction that would violate time reversal symmetry. And sure enough, there it is. And but the other kind doesn't occur. <laughs> so we still got a problem. Why doesn't it occur? <laughs> uh, the, so, but, but we're, so we're close to really finally understanding this profound, gratuitous feature of the world that it's almost, but not quite symmetric under reversing the di direction of time, but, but not quite there. And uh, to get, to understand that last bit is, a challenging frontier of physics today. Uh, and we have a promising proposal for how it works, which is a kind of theory of evolution. 
So there's this possible interaction, which we call a coupling, and there's a numerical quantity that tells us how strong that is. Mm -hmm. And traditionally in physics, we think of these kinds of numerical quantities as constants of nature that uh, you, you, you just have to put them in, right? <laughs> that, 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 that from experiment, uh, they have a certain value and that, that's it. And, you know, uh, who am I to question what God do? <laughs> they just cons well, they seem to be just constants. Uh, but in this case, it's been fruitful to think and work out a theory where that d strength of interaction is actually not a constant. It's a fun. It's a field. It's a uh, it's a fields are the fundamental ingredients of modern physics. Like there's an electron field, there's a photon field, which is also called the electromagnetic field, and so every all of these particles are manifestations of different fields, and uh, there could be a field, uh, something that depends on space and time, so a dynamical entity instead of just a constant here, and uh, if you do things in a nice way that's very symmetric very much suggested aesthetically by the theory uh by the, by the theory we do have then you find that you get a field which as it evolves from the early universe settles down to a value that's just right <laughs> to make the laws very nearly exact, <laughs> invariant or symmetric with respect to reversal of time. It might appear as a constant, but it's actually a field that evolved over time. It evolved over time, okay? But when you examine this proposal in detail, you find that it hasn't quite settled down to exactly zero. There, it's still the the field is still moving around a little bit, mm. and because the motion is so uh, the the motion is so difficult, the, the the material is so rigid, and this material that fills all the field that fills all space is so rigid. Even small amounts of motion can involve lots of energy, and that and that energy takes the form of uh, particles fields of fields that are in motion are always associated with particles and those are the axions and if you calculate how much energy is in these residual oscillations these this axion gas that fills all the universe if this fundamental theory is correct you get just the right amount to make the dark matter that astronomers want and it has just the right properties so I'd love to believe so the, that, 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 that might so that might be a, a thing that unlocks uh, might be the key to understanding dark matter. Yeah, I'd like to think so. And many many physicists are coming around to this point of view, which I've been a voice in the wilderness. <laughs> I was a voice in the wilderness so, for a long time, but now now it's become very popular, maybe even dominant in the So almost like so this axion particle slash field would be the thing that explains dark matter. It explain yeah, it would solve this fundamental question of finally of why the laws are almost but not quite exactly the same if you run them backwards in time and and then seemingly in a totally different conceptual universe it would also uh, provide under uh, give us an understanding of of the dark matter. That's not what it was designed for and the theory wasn't wasn't proposed with that in mind mm -hmm. but when you work out the equations that's what you get that's always a good sign yes. actually <laughs> uh i i think i vaguely read uh somewhere that there may be early experimental validation of uh, uh of axion is that uh am i am i reading the wrong <laughs> Well, there have been quite a few false alarms, and I think there are some of them still. I mean, people desperately want to find this thing, <laughs> and uh, uh, but I don't think I, I don't think any of them are convincing at this point. But there are very ambitious yes. experiments and uh, 
kind of new, you have to design new kinds of antennas that are capable of detecting these predicted particles. And it's, it's very difficult. They interact very, very weakly. If, if it were easy, it would have been done already. But, um, but I think there's good hope that uh, we can get down to the required sensitivity and actually test whether these ideas are right <laughs> in coming years or maybe decades. <laughs> and, then, and then understand one of the big mysteries, like literally big in terms of uh, its fraction of the universe is dark matter. Yes.